Hey, hi. Welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner. I'm a programmer at TIFF now, right now, and this is the other thing I do. My guest this week is Marusha Bachurka, a Toronto professor and filmmaker whose work includes Bodies of Trouble, Nancy Drew and the Mystery of the Haunted Body, and This is Gay Propaganda, LGBT Rights and the War in Ukraine. Her latest, Analog Revolution, How Feminist Media Changed the World, premieres at the Atlantic Film Festival this Friday, September 15th, and screens again on Sunday, September 17th at the Toronto Independent Film Festival. Marusha picked All the Beauty in the Bloodshed, Laura Poitras' Oscar-nominated documentary about the photographer and artist Nan Golden, her organization Prescription Addiction Intervention Now, and its campaign to have the Sackler family held accountable for their complicity in America's opioid epidemic by pressuring art galleries and museums to remove the family name from their spaces. It's a simple moral issue, but as Poitras shows us, it's one that's deeply personal for Golden. And in exploring the roots of her activism, the documentary grows more complex and moving by the minute. It was one of last year's best films. This is someone else's movie. Why, why do I love this film? Um, it, it leaves me gasping. So that's, you know, that's my emotive, affective response right off the bat. But I, I mean, I love it structurally. I love that, that it is a hybrid kind of film. It's, uh, you know, it's an activist documentary. That's, that's very clear. Very first scene is, is of a, you know, a uh, demonstration against the Sacklers. Um, and it's about the opioid crisis, but it's also a kind of essay style film. And, and that's the kind of film I make. That's the kind of film I love that I love to show students. So it touches upon so many different themes. And as a viewer, you can choose your focus, you know, is it is it about the opioid crisis or is it about the life of the artist? Um, is it about the trauma of, you know, is it about family trauma? Uh, you know, it's about all those things, but it it is nonlinear in a certain way. I mean, there's a linear progression with the um, the activist intent and the results, but it kind of the structure is almost spiral-like in that it keeps going back to certain moments, but at every moment you're at a higher level of understanding. And I really love that. Um, and it feels like a personal film, like a, a poetic personal documentary, but it's not. Um, it's not by Nan Golden, but it, feels like it is because of the immersive nature of the way that it's produced. I feel like Laura Poitras is really quite self-effacing in the film. I mean, you hear her voice occasionally, um, but the quality of those audio interviews um, and the, the texture, the kind of texture they bring to the film is really magnificent. It occurred to me that you could really boil this down very, very simply to pitch it to people as the story of a woman who survived one plague and refused to look the other way when a second one came up. Mm -hmm. But it's also about the way, I think the thing that really hit me the second time through was, was understanding that it's also a film about the way America demonizes victims, like mm -hmm. just immediately finds a reason. I, and, and I'm sure it's about the puritanical nature of the, of the country's founding. You know, this okay. was, um, this is not new, mm -hmm. uh, that America has always been a very reactionary conservative country, but, but the idea that gay people were blamed for AIDS mm -hmm. in the eighties, um, for, uh, because of their, you know, they were blamed because presumably of that they deserved it because of their lifestyle. That was the, the moral majority jumping in and, and all of those, the scolds that came up. And here, all of the people who have fallen to the opioid epidemic over and over again um, are just, they turn out to be victims of this ever increasing, ever malevolent conspiracy to sell product and hook people on things. It's just, they're 
they're being demonized. It, they can't acknowledge. It's as, it's as if the collective mind in the media and, and the and all the thumbsucker pieces you've seen about the opioid epidemic in the last ten years, none of them can acknowledge that it was simply a question of a balance sheet and human lives became worthless. So it, it's the perfect. It's this. It's the perfect argument uh, against capitalism, ultimately against unchecked capitalism, mm -hmm. and. They had to know they had to be deserving people. They had they had to be they had to be complicit somehow. They took the pill and now they're now they're addicted and and that's really as simple as it is. Like someone advised you, someone who was, you know, given a packet by a pharmaceutical salesperson and, or who had goals to meet and everybody had quotas and it was just about driving brand recognition and all this horrible stuff. And Nan Golden boils it down to compassion and mercy and kindness. And and from that rage, which I find fascinating, the the, mm -hmm. the anger that comes from watching people through no fault of their own be stigmatized after their suffering, as if the suffering alone wasn't enough of a punishment for whoever's doling out this imaginary punishment. The, like the moral thing, the moral aspect that's absent from her work, where she's even in the bedroom photographs, she never judges the subjects of her photographs, herself included. Mm -hmm. And she's simply showing you how people are. Mm -hmm. I mean, she she is an immersive photographer. You know, um, there she talks about how there is no, I forget how she said it, but there there's no separation between her and her audience. You know, mm -hmm. those 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 works began as you know, community-based work. She was part of that community. She's in a lot of the photographs. And it, if you don't mind me referencing my film. Please do. No, we were, we were going to get to it eventually. <laughs> it reminds me of what some of my subjects, you know, have said when they're talking about the early days of, you know, the port a pack and citizen journalism and, um, video in the hands of artists that, you know, those, those first days of, of, um, experimental and artistic video and, um, you know, uh, Bonnie Cher Klein saying in my film, we were the audience, the audience was us, there was no separation. So that, that feels very familiar to me. There's no way she would have been judging the subjects of her photos because she too, what, you know, there's industry subjectivity there. Um, and, and that's kind of also what I love about the film is the way that it shows the length and breadth of activism. And, you know, again, I'm reminded by Anne Golden in my, and I'll, I'm going to try to stop referencing my film. You must understand. I'm so. Oh, you're in it. No, I completely understand. That's how it is. And this is fine because most of the people listening to this haven't heard it, haven't seen the film yet. So you'll be fine. Uh, you know, Editing, them... so, you know, it's fine. Um, but, uh, you know, Anne Golden talks about um, sort of the early days of video activism as intervention. And so she talks about how, you know, if the news media came to the demonstration, they would film there would be, you know, a minute or two of people marching. There might be some commentary about how business was disrupted, blah, blah, blah. But they won't be there for the organizing of the march. And they certainly won't be there at the end during the, the debrief. And um, I I love that about the film, the sort of the, the, the process-oriented way that it describes activism. So I think... That echoes Nan Golden's photography, that kind of intersubjectivity, the, you know, the loss of the idea that the, that journalistic problem of, you know, supposed impartiality is absolutely not there. And in the hands of Laura Poitra, you know, it, um, that loss of subjectivity, or loss of object, the, the loss of the pretense of objectivity opens up the film and, and delivers us to the heart of activism, which is about community and repair and healing. And um, those, to me, are the overriding peoples of the film, healing from 
you know, the emotional abuse in the in Golden's family healing from the from the abuses of the pharmaceutical industry, the the trauma and the loss of of AIDS. Um, and I, I think that that's become a trope of, you know, recent memoir and, and, you know, perhaps even documentary film is to, to talk about repair, to not just talk about the problem, but to talk about how the problem can be healed. And in this case, you know, it's partially through, um, through activism and it's a you know in some ways a very elite form of activism i mean nan golden is a very powerful figure it doesn't quite reflect the way most of us embark on um you know on in, into activist struggle but at the same time there's uh there's quite a bit of time devoted to you know the the group meeting. It's intergenerational. Um, uh, it's it feels like there's a collective process. So that becomes part of the healing is community building, and I I think we understand that even more since the pandemic. You know that 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 along with vaccines is what's what's going to help us move out of you know the the aftermath of the of the pandemic i certainly hope so um if we're not looking out for each other if we're mm -hmm. not uh i mean and and of course the pandemic also taught us that a lot of us aren't that that a lot of people really just cannot abide even the smallest adjustment in their behavior mm -hmm. uh for the thought of saving other people because that's just not who they are which i you know fine they'll be dead soon it's not my problem but mm -hmm. it kind of is my problem right like the, that's that's then that was an incredibly facile dismissal of a very complex situation but that is sort of what i do um it is it is it's a constant push and pull i think in in art to give so much of yourself to your work that that you you any successful artist risks the the trap of just doing the same thing again right doing the mm -hmm. thing that did well before and 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 succeeding again and again and again and just coasting on on early success um the the fact of golden's longevity seems to me to be that she is constantly re-examining what people want from her and what she wants from her mm -hmm. art to the mm -hmm. point where here um, in the film, it gets brought up that she has pieces in the museums that the Sacklers have donated to. She's protesting in a way the support of her own work, or at least theoretically endangering mm -hmm. it. Um, but it's just where she is now. And where she is now is in a place where, yeah, she's a she's a legend and she's, she's a revered uh, artist and activist, but she is also I guess, fully aware of where her priorities lie and where they've always lain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and so she models a certain kind of behavior and care as, you know, as an art star. Mm. Um, she, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by the lack of, I mean, there's a great deal of attention to branding in the, in the activism. Yeah. Um, but the lack of, you know, um, attention to branding, especially in her early work, but of course that was characteristic of most artists at that time, you know, I, it felt very familiar to me as, as an artist that kind of came out of the Queen Street, Street West community and, and, um, you know, was part of battles against censorship in the, in the 1980s and um uh and our art and our activism were were very merged it, in many ways they were inseparable it was just before neoliberalism you know neoliberalism came later to canada than to the us it i was i feel so lucky to have come of age in an era where um you know it really was about 
the art and um, an engagement with 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 community. And I, you know, as a as a professor, I, um, you know, I teach um, young media artists and creatives, as they call themselves, and they are so invested in and so burdened by the branding process. They are very deeply engaged in branding. I mean, there's no nothing metaphoric about it. They talk about it. They um, you know, that's how they approach social media, but it's also how they approach their their media making practice. And I see how constraining it is, how muffling it is, how much they want to say, but how little they can allow themselves to say. And so, you know, looking at an artist like Nan Golden opens, gives us an opportunity to see how to see different ways that creative expression can operate. Have you shown them the film? Have you exposed them to it? Her work? Uh, no, you know, unfortunately, in the program that I teach, there is one documentary course. It is a semester long. It's documentary production. I cram in so many film excerpts. I don't know that I've ever been able to show them an entire film. Um, you know, there really needs to be a documentary studies film uh, class as well, in any case. Um, but I've shown them films like that, you know, uh, autoethnographic works. And and uh, it really opens their eyes because um, they're also, they're afraid to use the first person. They're afraid to engage in personal, even though yeah, well, I mean, yeah, aside from, you know, the solipsism of of TikTok, but within this particular neoliberal university setting where they're hoping to get industry jobs, not that there are very many, um, they are taught to, to stay away from the personal. So that's, you know, that's something you do on social media. It's not necessarily something you do in your your first film your your calling card film whatever i mean this is i'm i'm talking about a very particular program so it's not an art school um but it is increasingly the way universities are going but don't get me started on that well i'm just i'm fascinated by the way that um the next generation of of filmmakers the next generation of commercial filmmakers if nothing else are, are starting to approach things because I've been experiencing an incredible wave of deeply, deeply personal films from mm -hmm. mostly through the Talent to Watch program from people who previously wouldn't have had the chance to make a film mm -hmm. maybe this young or this quickly, uh, or people who've been in the industry for years but never directed before because the, the window wasn't there. And it's like watching a flood of first novels in a really good way. You're just seeing people put everything into the story that they're telling because they don't know if they're gonna get another shot. Yeah, yeah. And it's almost always personal. It's almost always about them because mm -hmm. that's when you're young, that's all you've got. I mean, again, like Nan Golden, including herself in her photographs, because why wouldn't she? This was the world that she's in and she's putting everything out there. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea that, it, yeah, the idea that you're separating your creative personality into social media stuff and then the thing you want to be known for. Surely at this point, it's just it's all one and the same. Yeah, I mean, you know, I teach in a program that is oriented towards broadcast media. So that's a that's that's a whole different system. Mm. Um in some ways very archaic, a disappearing kind of system in a way. Um and so there's there's a great investment by the the powers that be to um to you know treat the the pedagogy as a route to industry employment and so there's no room within there's very little room within that narrow paradigm for um for the unfolding of an artistic process and, was, yeah that's an experience I can relate to uh, mm -hmm. from 
going to film school in the late eighties where, you know, in Canada, in Toronto, it's, well, you might be an editor, you, you know, maybe you'll, maybe you'll get a chance to, to be uh, a DP, but don't think about having a career in, in film artistically. Don't think about expressing yourself in any way. And this is at a time when, you know, Canadian cinema, Toronto cinema specifically was having this incredible explosion of talent, which just didn't make it up to, uh, to York university, as far as I could tell. Yeah. yeah. And, and I don't mean the people I was in class with weren't the talent they've gone on. Some of them are, you know, part of Oscar winning production design teams, actually. Yeah. But the idea was our classes, our education stopped at around 1972. That's just as far as anybody went. And yeah. they weren't interested. And this was 1987. They just weren't interested in exploring any further, which didn't make sense to any of us. Yeah, totally. So I try to corrupt the students. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, uh, for a while I was forcing them to go to see live documentary link like, to go to an actual bricks and mortar documentary screening. And I would tell them they, you know, they had to show me a photo of the ticket. Um, you know, they had to show proof that they had actually been there. I swear I got at least one photoshopped photo, but then I thought, well, that's an art piece too. <laughs> um, and they were blown away, you know, like a bunch of them went to a film about Buddhism at the hot dog cinema and, and actual Buddhist monks came in chanting into the cinema and they were, they barely knew what to say about it. So, you know, those kinds of, you know, documentary is, so much about the social it's um so much about community and the interaction between the the film and the audience and you know nan golden um she talks about her early slideshows yep you know sort of like slide tape shows we used to do that kind of stuff it's you know and it it reminds, like, I'm also, you know, interested in, and I've, you know, as a, as a scholar, I've been interested in this for the long time, the ways in which one technology anticipates the other, that kind of McLuhan-esque, you know, kind of progression of, of, uh, of media, the, the medium kind of telling a story that is then uh, taken up by future uh, platforms. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, her slideshows remind me a little bit about TikTok. And she talks a, a little bit of tip, yeah, like just the the sort of the the flatness of them, um uh the progression of of images that feel like found images, although they are very carefully composed. And then the ways that like she talks about people talking back at the screen, you know, at the event, which is very much like, you know commentary on social media and then she would edit according to those comments yeah yeah she would respond to that that instantaneous feedback uh so i i love that um getting a sense of a reminder of the ways that we used to show work you know um and the ways that we were together in a room and um sharing our responses and that still happens like yesterday last night I was at a you know a film attended by 12 people at at the hot dog cinema um what was it called the pawn shop and there was a way in which we were all communicating in the room you know one person would laugh and then another person would pick up on oh yeah that is actually kind of funny and <laughs> um it's really good to be reminded of the origins of that so that we can map our way back to it. Yeah, I I was talking to someone the other day about seeing Blue Velvet in a, a shoebox at the Carlton Cinema with four other people. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget the experience of that screening because, I mean, I, I assume I would never have forgotten seeing Blue Velvet anyway, but the experience of seeing it with four other people who all somehow understood how weirdly precious this experience is. Because mm -hmm. the movies, the movies I remember the most vividly, or the cinematic experiences I remember the most vividly are full houses or empty ones. 
Um, I, I, I saw, I introduced a screening last year of Montana Story to, I think it was 23 people. It was just a really small group of people. It was a Saturday in the summer and it, there was a ball game and we just, we didn't get a turnout. It was an afternoon show. And it was in the biggest room we have at the light box. You know, it's a 550 seat theater and there were 23 people there and somehow it worked. It, mm -hmm. It's a tiny, intimate film. It's about, you know, a young woman coming home to care for a dying father and, and just thinking about who she is in relationship to her brother and, and the world that they live in versus the world that she's come from, the world she's escaped to. And a, honestly, I swear, a quiet contemplation among 23 people in a great big venue. There's There's something really magical about that. Yeah. Oh, God, I remember during a brief heyday when I was showing films in Berlin a lot. <laughs> Go on. A Berlin-based distributor who would take me out for fancy dinners. I mean, this was like the peak of my career, I think. And um, there were, I remember screening work in cinemas that would seat 15 people, I swear. And that was just, that was fine. That was how that scene kind of worked. Of course, you know, we had it here, too. I mean, how many people did the funnel seat? Like, you know, 21? I don't know. Um, yeah, and and I think we, you know, we've gotten away from that. And, and as I begin to distribute my film, it's like, you know, it's all about festivals and, and screening numbers and so on. But, but I, what I always used to tell my students and what I try to remember myself is that I feel like with documentary and especially with activist documentary, it's about what the film does, not where it goes. I mean, we love, you know, we love the exposure, but it's so important to um, to see what to to have a social impact with the film. And sometimes that happens in the strangest ways um, uh, and the strangest places. Hey, it's Norm interrupting my own show to bring you up to speed on Shiny Things, my newsletter about physical media, culture, and the odd streaming project. I've been swallowed by TIFF this week, but there's a lot of stuff coming up, including a review of Celine Song's wonderful debut feature, Past Lives. Sign up for a 14-day free trial at shiny-things.ghost.io or find a link at the Semcast Twitter account. You like reading about movies? I like writing about them. Come check it out. I, I was too young to get there. I didn't get to New York for the first time until 92. And it was already sort of changing from what it used to be to what it is now. But the blank city movement in the 70s and 80s and, and the way that, I mean, they might be giants and their drum machine, which was just a reel to reel recorder with the drum beats on it, would open for Blondie in, in the yeah. 70s and I, I, or the early 80s. And I, I find that absolutely fascinating. And just the sense that what Nan Golden is saying we're all in it together. Come see my movie. Come mm -hmm. see the thing I've done because it's about you. Yeah. That's the thing you feel when you're in that audience with a tiny, in a tiny box. I mean, um, do you remember camera had a screening room, the camera oh, gallery? Yes. Yeah. Yes. For, for, oh, for people yeah, for listening, it was a tiny little room that seated 40, 50 people yeah. and had a very small screen, but they play Bergman's Saraband there. And it's yes. an incredible, it was an incredibly moving experience to be trapped in this tiny space with something so intimate and powerful. Yeah, yeah. I think I just, I walked in there once on a Sunday afternoon and some interminable experimental film was playing and it was, it was fantastic. It was just like, yeah, okay, I'm just going to surrender to this moment. I think it was free, you know, there were. Oh, that's right. They had weekend screenings. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's, let's revive, you should revive those kinds of things. You can do it. Oh God, I love coaxing people out of their houses to see something unexpected. Yeah, to, yeah. Or the the idea too, that more and more people see the price of a movie ticket as justification for only watching something big and expensive and, you know, Fast X or a Marvel movie that we're gearing towards this sort of thing. Where meanwhile, I work in a building that shows strange, obscure art films more often than popular, well, populist features mm -hmm. and we get people we get people coming out to see the north screenings the wavelength screenings year round there's there's something truly inspiring about knowing and we had all the beauty and the bloodshed and it played for weeks 
uh, yeah. which was great last uh, over Christmas over December uh, to just see people coming out over and over again for this film about an artist they were sort of aware of made by a person who they think they heard won an Oscar for something. It was just, it was this, everybody going in would mm -hmm. say the same thing, which is that, oh, I heard this was good. And that mm -hmm. was it. That was their reason to come see it. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't, the tickets were cheap. It wasn't that the popcorn was good. They just heard a very general buzz. This mm -hmm. was before the awards nomination started flowing and, and, the, and that conversation, the critics awards, it, just people coming to see the movie that they heard was good. And I, I, I love that so mm -hmm. much. And it, mm -hmm. it just feels like something, it, it makes me feel like the art form isn't dying, if that makes sense. That a movie that is simply about one artist trying to, to fix a thing that's wrong, to simply call people's attention. Um, and this, this was something that I, I talked about when it played was the, the, the really remarkable statement that the film makes, which is about longevity, which is about time and how hard it is to stay committed as an artist in a world where people don't have an attention span, mm -hmm. where, you know, like Nan Golden would not do very well on TikTok, although I'm sure there's footage of her Sackler protests. Um, but she is about sitting and thinking and talking in the moment and living an experience. And that is that seems like it is completely counterintuitive to where culture is going. And yet she continues to do it and do it well. Mm -hmm. But how do you do that? How do you build a legacy? How does anyone build a legacy when, as we all know, no one knows what's going to happen next. You don't know where your art will take you. I, I can't imagine Nan Golden or Laura Portress thought they were going to end up here when they started their careers. Mm. It's just such a, it's such a remarkable, unlikely intersection. Mm -hmm. um, and in that intersection are all of these lives, all of these thousands upon thousands of people who are tangled up in, in HIV and in, in the opioid crisis. And Golden manages to speak for all of them and none of them at the same time, because she's so, so fixed in her own story that and I don't mean that I don't mean to suggest that she's ignoring everyone else's, but by telling her story, she tells all of them. She manages to encompass all of these things. And it's a it's remarkable because there's no narcissism, there's no sense of martyrdom. You are seeing someone who is like just just a vessel for this for these decades of experience and who just happened to be in the right place at the right time and the wrong place too, because she was addicted for years and, mm -hmm. and it nearly destroyed her. And only by recovering from it, can she understand what everyone else that she represents is going through. But, but again, like how, how does someone reach that point? That's like, that's sainthood. Well, yeah. I resist, like, yeah. I immediately like regret that. Yeah. Um, I, I think I would say that, you know, in many ways, she is, yes, she's an icon and and she's, you know, an art star. Um, but, you know, I think I said this before, a lot of what she talks about the process of art making, um, the sense of witnessing, uh, the sense of, you know, I, I wrote down something she said about her camera. Photography is a way to walk through fear that that felt you know that that feels more familiar to me than she's a great artist and you know whatever um i think the the use of of one's art practice as a way to grapple with with our lives with with trauma with memory is you know very central to why we keep doing the work my brother, you know, there's addiction in my family. My brother lived and died on, on the downtown east side of Vancouver. His drug was alcohol. But um, when almost as soon as it happened, I just knew that I had to make art about it. I had to, you know, I had to do something. It became an obsession for you know, many years, I made like a radio documentary and, and uh, I produced a, a, he was a street musician, I produced a CD of his music. 
and I, you know, one at some point I had to tell myself to stop. I had to move on, but, you know, I really vibed to that, that, that really central story of sibling death and, and a, kind of a, you know, when, when my, when my brother died, people would say, oh, it must have been so hard for your mother. And of course it was, but it's just as hard for the siblings. It's, it's this strange shift of birth order and there's survivor's guilt. And of course, wishing you could have done something or you had known something before you knew it. So I just, I, I really related to that on a personal level and the way that the film really only starts to grapple with Nan Golden's sister's death till the end. In, mm. in a sense, the beginning of the film becomes the end of the film. Um, rings very true to me. The entire film is haunted by her sister and informed by it and then it forms her art practice and um you know that's why we do the work we're we're trying we're breaking open a wound and then trying to heal it and we're constantly doing that if we're if we're authentic artists we are going to the that place of that greatest place of fear and and working with it and through it and so but it's not therapy because there's such there's so much that comes out of it it's it is about the process but it is also very much about you know getting those photographs out into the world make making sure they have an impact listening to the audience thinking through what they're saying applying it, if not to that work, then to the next work. The work goes out into the world and it comes back a different work, you know, informed by everything that people have said about it. And then that builds into the next work. So for me, I saw all of that in the film as well. Yeah, you, you're you mentioning of it as a spiral early on mm -hmm. at the top of the, the conversation is... Yeah, you can't fully understand the pattern until you've stepped out of it, until you're, you've are you moved away from it. And I wonder how much of that is, you know, Poitras' editing strategy, or did she know it was always going to work that way, or did it just come through the, her interactions with Golden? This, this, this weird alchemy directors and subjects have in documentary that you can never... Someone once said that, you know, like, the best documentaries are made by people who don't know how they're going to come out. And just, mm -hmm. they have a vague idea that they need to pursue, mm -hmm. but. Yeah. Um, I mean, my experience is the film is made and remade and remade in the edit room. Yeah. The same time that I, you know, I always work from a, or not always, I do now work from a treatment, partly because, you know, I teach my students to do that. And then I feel guilty and I'm like, <laughs> I better fucking write a treatment. Um, if I'm not going to be a hypocrite, so it's, you know, maybe it's like the last 10 years, but, um, but I've, I found that's really helpful because the treatment is a fiction, you know, it, it's, it kind of emerges out of your grant writing and it's part bullshit and it's part delusional fantasy, but it's, you know, it, it manifests through that and you keep going back to it and you're like, what did I say I was going to do? Oh my God. Um, you know, and then, and then you're, you're, you're fighting it out with the editor <laughs> and, um, and the editor has their own vision. If they're a good editor, uh, yeah, I, I don't know her process, but I suspect that it developed. I didn't I think I read something about how the audio interviews were kind of came after I think because she felt there was something missing in the, I don't know, I, I can't quite remember, but um, I thought that was very interesting and it made me think of Alana Sobomsawin who talks about, you know, she talks about how she always does a pre-interview that she records and she makes a, a good quality recording of the pre-interview and, you know, it's kind of standard documentary practice to do 
a pre-interview. I usually do it over the phone. Mm. Um, uh, but she talks about how that that first interview is sacred. And she ends up using quite a bit of it, you know, and it's just audio. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I found there was an incredible richness in the audio. There's, there are very few, very few talking heads in the film. It's, it almost feels like an expository film because of the extent of the use of Nan Golden's voice, but it's like, it's like she's talking to a friend in the middle of the night. You know, it just has that feeling and the way that she uses her voice. It's not, you know, she's not using it to narrate. She's in conversation. Um, so I thought I thought that was a really interesting strategy. Yeah, it struck me that the form of the film is messy in the same way her photographs appear to be messy. It's intensely structured. It has to be because it's you know a polished documentary presentation. But people are looking at the camera and in the in the archival footage, there's there's constant sense that the camera of the film is present. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the same thing in terms of the the audio, the conversations are very casual and 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 uh, informal and it gives you this same representation or sort of it's the it's the aesthetic representation of intimacy of closeness it puts us there and makes us experience things as though we were in the room with them and i mean how do you not identify with that yeah yeah it's it's very powerful and i'm glad you mentioned the archival footage that's um it's very seamlessly integrated into the film. You know, when I saw it, I was, we were still editing and I was like emailing my, my editing team, like, you have to watch this film. I'll, I'll pay the $4.99 for you to buy it. And, and, <laughs> um, and then they were like, what, what did, what was it you wanted us to notice? Like what, I don't see the relationship. And, and I think that's because the the archival footage is is you know very much made to seem like part of the film as opposed to like this is an archive, which I think you know I I'm not saying one technique is better than the other, um, but the way in which the archive helps us to you know to understand the, the there's this idea around archives as being the future anterior what will be seen to have been mm. and so we we get an opportunity to to see the ways in which art and activism were done in the 80s which was a peak time for for feminism for, you know i say the 80s were my 60s a peak time for um, you know, artists' activism. And we need that to to map out the future. We need those those images and even those, you know, those film excerpts, the you know, Vivian Dix films and and um uh you know to see in on one hand the possibilities that existed within that historical moment but also to see the resonance between that moment and this moment. So many of my students are guilty of historicism. I mean, I'm being so hard on them. They're all so lovely. <laughs> but there's this historicism, you know, feminism began with the Me Too movement and experimental art began with, I don't know, YouTube or TikTok or whatever. Um, so the archival aspect of the film, which is huge, of the beauty and the bloodshed is uh you know is very much about future possibility i think yeah well and also of course that so many of those people are gone mm -hmm. it just feels like they're leaving communiques for us to discover now yeah yeah the whole section on aids and grief and mourning um of course, with a great deal of resonance, resonance for COVID, yeah. um, but also a, a very unique moment in which an entire 
generation of artists and activists was, you know, was wiped out um, alongside the incredible innovation of activism during that period, which is then picked up by the pain group. And they're using, you know, many of those sort of um, direct action AIDS tactics. So to see that, that resonance happening. Yeah, it's remarkable to see how much the older generation still has to offer the new generation that, uh, yeah, it's the same historicism, right? What a plague, we've never had one of those before. And um, the, the sense during COVID that HIV was the warning that the idea of a global easily transmittable lethal virus, or you know, extremely dangerous uh, at, at best, was something that had never been pressed. It was completely unprecedented. And then eventually the people would talk about the flu because it was similarly transmitted. But yeah, HIV was right there. And we learned nothing. I mean, here in Toronto, we had SARS 20 years ago. And, and again, people just did not learn from that experience. Well, yeah, I don't completely agree with that because I, I, um, I did see, you know, we saw, you know, a rise in the notion of mutual aid and fantastic mutual aid projects that, you know, a huge one that was initiated in Toronto, I can't remember the name of it now, um, that a friend of mine started and it, you know, went global. God, what was it called? It was like on Facebook and, and it was just a network of ways that people were helping one another out. And also, you know, many of us were using, um, deploying the the notion of harm reduction around you know around covid and um you know and critiquing the 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 limitations of social distancing and the exhortations from the government to isolate and you know building community networks despite all that right i'm sorry i was i did mean the government response is not the individual oh, social yeah. responses yeah yeah but yeah, it's a perfectly valid point. There were individuals, as as we see in this film, there are individuals doing the work that the that the institutions won't do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's kind of where we're at with with so many things right now. I love that the the activism of pain does engage on many different levels. So they do, you know, they do government lobbying. They um, they have, you know, they had that one adorable lawyer, <laughs> uh, you know, working against the Purdue family legal team, um, you know, and then doing direct action and putting stickers on things. You know, I think that kind of multivalenced activism is the most effective. And it, it reminds me of, you know, of, of how feminism worked in the 80s. Um, sort of very, very performative actions, the theatricality of, you know, the ways in which we fought for abortion rights uh, alongside legal challenges, alongside journalistic advocacy, alongside artistic advocacy. So, you know, to me, the film is also very feminist. It's, you know, the ballad of sexual dependency, Nan Golden's you know, um, iconic magnum opus photos. Yeah. Is, um, to me is, is very much a feminist work. I mean, she's, she's talking largely about female sexual dependency, um, and, you know, photographing herself with a black eye, a beaten up face mm -hmm. and how those photographs reminded her to not go back to that relationship um, and how women told her those photographs helped them to leave relationships. So that kind of, you know, grassroots sort of feminist communication through, through images felt very familiar to me. And that does open the door to talking about analog revolution a little bit more. Uh, I usually wrap the episode by asking the guests if there's anything that they've 
borrowed or lifted or outright stolen from the film they've chosen <laughs> in their own work. But I think asking about Nan Gold and, and, and talking about her methods does sort of lead right into your documentary. So if, if there's a link there, we can explore that. And if there's something else that uh, that jumps up, by all means. Certainly the, uh, the, the archive. I mean, the archive has been an obsession for me since, you know, art school. Um, I took an art history class. The textbook was Jansen's History of Art, 830 something pages, not a single woman in it. And, you know, it's still the, the primary art historical text, although they have added some women. And, you know, not knowing anything about how archives work, I set about establishing a kind of archive of, I didn't call it an archive, it was the Women Artists File, we called it a the library of my art school at Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. It still exists. It's since been digitized. It's now, you know, it's, it was like a messy thing of like cutouts from magazines, women artists, blah, blah, blah. Um, but ever since then, I've I've just been very aware of, you know, how the archive is as much about what it excludes as what it includes mm -hmm. and um and and the need for counter archives so you know nan golden's photography is a kind of counter archive of you know new york city in a, at a certain era she talks about how at the time you weren't supposed to tell a personal story you weren't supposed to be a woman artist, you know, you weren't supposed to be successful. And that really resonated for me in terms of how it was to, you know, to write, uh, to write about feminism, to create feminist work in the 80s. Uh, and that was through this film, something that I, I really wanted to capture that there was this incredible innovation that itself has not been archived adequately. So, so the young women and young men for that matter, don't have a template for, or perhaps even a vocabulary for the things that they want to see changed. Um, you know, something that came up a lot in the past year was a rise in assaults at TMU, mostly against women. Um, and you know, I would, and my students were talking about it quite a bit because we were, our class was in a building where most of the assaults were happening. The university was not responding adequately. It was not providing enough information. You know, these these archaic tactics, like cops that don't tell, don't announce, you know, that there's a rapist on the loose. Those kinds of things have, have always been problematic. And so we tell people, students about like take back the night marches or, you know, I brought in a poster from an action I was part of in the 80s called Curfew for Men, where we made this fake city of Toronto poster and we put it all over the city. And it was like men over the age of 16 have to be home by 7 p.m. because of the rise of rape you know, we had rape statistics on the poster in a city of Toronto logo and people thought it was true and they phoned the city and, um, you know, just talking to them about direct action, about organizations, about the fight for rape crisis centers, all of that is new to them. All of that is new information to them. And um, that is, that is really a tragedy in terms of a lack of resources, a lack of history, a lack of ways of knowing how to how to resist. Yeah, here we are with presumably more access to information than anything that's ever been possible before. And the institutional memory of 30 years ago is just evaporated. I mean, I remember a similar situation at, at York when I was there. There were tunnels that people were advised not to go into mm. like just between residences and buildings in the dead of winter they had a they had an elaborate tunnel network i assume it's still there um but people were being assaulted and it was simply 
yeah, muttered about. There was never, as far as I remember, there was never anything from the campus. So I suppose that's why there'd be no record of it. But but surely these things are passed along by generation. I guess they're not. I think that's exactly what you're telling me. That's the whole point. Yes. And these are, you know, these are intentional forms of suppression. The my film tracks the, you know, the the sort of trifecta of methods in which you know the power of feminist communications at that time was suppressed moral panics and slash censorship cutbacks and you know and also infighting that was partially caused by just how broke and burnt out everyone was mm. but the cutbacks were especially targeted they were targeted to women's groups um, to lesbian groups, to indigenous organizations um, via, you know, very conscious strategies of the neoliberal right wing at the time, the Mulroney government in the U.S., um, you know, Reagan, Bush. Um, and this was at a moment when, um, when feminism was, was at its height there were almost a thousand feminist publications across Canada. Right now there's, you know, maybe 15. Um, and what happened was that women went to other organizations and continued their, their feminism there. And, you know, we kind of see that with in Nan Golden's film that there is, there is a very strong kind of, feminist matriarchal kind of feel to that organization that you know that emerges partly out of strategies of the AIDS movement but also out of you know really uh really important strategies of feminist collectivity I wish I could remember who said it but the was it all great activist movements uh, arise from necessity not from alliance the cause unites the people rather than the people finding themselves united around the cause. The cause has to exist first and then people are drawn to it. Both. I would say it's both. Um, uh, you know, another thing that came out of that I understood just from, you know, interviewing women for the film is, is that the, the getting together in a room, you, you know, you had to do that to do paste up or, the, the newspaper or the journal you were putting out and you had to meet once a month and and three days of paste up and cutting things and waxing things and and over that time you would talk and you would develop strategies for the next event that you were going to or or you'd figure out who was sleeping with whom or <laughs> uh, who had broken up with whom or you know whatever but that that was what made the analog movement, I think, much more powerful. And that's part of my thesis is that that we actually got more shit done in the analog era because it was so embodied and because we were forced to come together in a room and, and not just work, but also laugh and and you know, and and we socialized together and we had sex and you know, all of those things again, very very much part of, you know, the art scene that, that Nan Golden was part of. Um, and and I think that's what we're we're trying to and needing to get back to is, you know, how how can we how can we fight that isolation that's that's still haunting us from the the pandemic and really address, you know, what's going on with climate, what's going on with, um, you know, housing, what's going on with poverty. We're just not going to get it done through Zoom meetings. My thanks to Marusha Bachurkov, whose latest documentary, Analog Revolution, How Feminist Media Changed the World, premieres this Friday, September 15th, at the Atlantic Film Festival in Halifax, and then comes to the Toronto Independent Film Festival on Sunday, September 17th. Thanks also to Angie Power. She knows what she did. You can find Marusha on Twitter at Marusha B. That's M-A-R-U-S-Y-A-B-E-E. -E. And you can find All the Beauty and the Bloodshed streaming on Max and Direct TV in the U.S. 
and available to rent or buy on various VOD services in the U.S. and Canada. A Criterion edition is coming, should be announced soon, hopefully with an archive of Nan Golden's own work. You can find me on Twitter for a little while longer, at Norm Wilner, and you can find this podcast there at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. The first year of the show is still available for 20 bucks at payhip.com slash semcast. That's the first 52 episodes of Someone Else's Movie, 44 of which aren't currently available anywhere else. And check out my newsletter, Shiny Things, at shiny-things.ghost.io. I think you'll enjoy it. Our theme song is by the last year. If you like it or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review wherever you've been listening. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're doing that. Stay safe. Watch movies. Wear a mask if you go out. Get the new booster when you can. I'll see you next week.